Bible and look at uh, at uh, Judges, the 14th chapter. I want you to bear with me as we uh, continue studying and looking at Samson. Before I read the scriptures in Judges 14 and verse 5, I was kind of debating on whether to say anything about this because I don't want to come out the wrong way, but, but I believe I'm supposed to say it. And uh, so hear it the way it's supposed to be heard. But uh, if you were here last week in Judges, uh, we preached a message about um, the power of your personal prophecy in warring against the enemy and fulfilling your destiny. And um, he's attacked by a lion here, and, and uh, he wasn't killed by that lion because there was a prophetic word over his life. And that prophetic word was he was going to lead Israel to... Um, to begin to be delivered from the Philistine stronghold. And we found a verse over in Timothy where Tim, Paul told Timothy that uh, wage a good warfare by the prophecies that have been uh, prayed uh, imparted over your life. And uh, he said it's a warfare. You win this warfare by understanding these prophecies. Well, you know what? Uh, about Sunday afternoon after I got home, the lion roared. And I mean, he roared. Now, he didn't roar in another person. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Hey, but he roared. He turned me inside out and upside down in my thinking and fighting with him. About 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, he was still roaring. And I'm beginning to go back and start remembering what God has said over my life and specifically what God said over this church. And he's roaring. And Monday he roared. And Tuesday he roared. And Monday night he roared. Tuesday night. Monday night was great prayer time up here. Just great prayer time. I walked out of here thinking such victory in this place. And and wow, we had we had we had a you gotta come to see it and believe it. But at the end of our about two hours of praying, just the fellowship, the sweetest fellowship fell upon us of just happiness and joy in the Lord, and we started dancing together in here, and uh, it was just glorious, and I thought, man, I just think it's broken. I went home, two or three o'clock in the morning, hello, the lion's roaring again. I've read a lot about men who are a lot greater than me and done a lot more, a lot much greater things than me, and I've read about how Martin Luther, when he would get into those times when the lion was roaring, and one time he took his ink pot, he didn't have a, you know, ink pen, you know, in those days, he had an ink pot, and he threw his ink pot at the devil in his room, across the way. I read about my favorite preacher, Charles Spurgeon, and he'd go into this things where just the darkness would send upon him, and the lion would roar, and he would sometimes take weeks out of the pulpit and go down into Mentone, France, on the seashore, and just try to work his way through it and, I, 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 and he said why well, you're telling us I don't tell you this to make you feel sorry for me at all I, I want to tell you this that what did I say last week I said that the bigger your obstacle the greater the destiny and what it just does is the enemy always overplays his hand it just reaffirms in me what the promises are that he's made are going to come true and not to look with the eye of the flesh but to continue being focused on what God's called me to do and let God bring the increase. We have been through a season of transition this year, and in that season of transition, it's very easy for people to leave the post that God assigns them to for much easier and friendly waters or friendly places. And I just encourage you, hold on to the post that God has assigned you. Do not commit apostasy. Apostasy is when you walk away from the post that God has given you. Mainly we use it in talking about what we believe, if we walk away from what we believe, but it's also about the assignment that God gives you in life and where to serve. Hang on, hang on. There is a river that is being dammed up and the dam's about to break and it's going to flow. And we're going to be ready to receive it and uh, it's going to be a good thing. But just know that what we're preaching about up here, these are not Sunday school stories. This is real stuff. And after my week last week, I'm real tempted this morning to preach on the devil's a really nice guy and God's in heaven and all's well with the world. <laughs> I 
lie. That's just real tempting, but not tempting long because it's a lie. It's not the truth. He's a father of liars. He's been a liar from the beginning. There's no truth in him. And he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. He is slew foot, but his fangs have been taken out. And he has no authority or power ultimately over the child of God. From the moment Jesus died on the cross, his days are numbered. And he knows that. And because his days are short, he roars greatly to bring fear into the hearts of men. But let him roar because he is a defeated foe and a fallen star. He has no authority or right over the child of God. So just know this is real stuff we're walking in. Amen? Amen. Real stuff. I had to go back and write out what God had said about what uh, prophetic truths he's given me about my life and about my family and about my, my about, about the church and I'm writing these things down because Paul told Timothy wage the warfare with those prophecies so I was shouting those prophecies waving those prophecies before the Lord and uh, I mean for the enemy and it took it took days but uh, before he he decided to uh, take leave for a season you know he ain't getting anywhere with this guy and he took leave for a season we have the ultimate victory no doubt in our lives. Let me read to you some of the passage today. We're going to get in the Word. I'm going to try to make it as quick as I can to get through it today. Chapter 14. Let's read some of the same we read last week. Verse 5 uh, begins a uh, very important part of the story. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and his mother, and he came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcasses of the lion. And he took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So his father went down to the woman. Samson gave a feast there for young men used to do so. And it happened when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, let me pose a riddle to you. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And they said to him, pose your riddle that we may hear it. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Now, for three days, they could not explain the riddle. But, they came, but it came to pass on the seventh day, they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we're going to burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? Then Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. And he said to her, Look, I have not explained it to my father and mother, so should I explain it to you? Now she had wept on him the seven days. While their feast lasted, and it happened on the seventh day that he told her, because she pressed him so much, then she explained the riddle to the sons of the people. So the men of the city said to him, on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Don't ever call your wife a heifer, you know. I don't care if she did give away your secrets, you know. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. He went down to another city, Ashkelon, and he killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, gave the changes of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused, and he went back up to his father's house. I want to speak to this this morning on we know something you do not know. 
wisdom and power in changing culture. We know something you don't know. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray wisdom, authority, and anointing. Let it flow, let it flow quickly today. Let it come into our hearts and our minds, and Lord, may we learn truth, and may the truth set us free. We ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, the great lover of our souls, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. From the very beginning, God wanted his people to take over the world and use the wisdom he had given them to expand his kingdom everywhere. We go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. And what were the first words that God would tell Adam and Eve? God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. They were to take the kingdom they were experiencing under God in the Garden of Eden and move it outward over all of the earth. We find this true in Abraham's day that the blessing that was on Abraham was for that very reason. Genesis twenty two eighteen, 18. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves because you have obeyed my voice. Because you've obeyed me. Yet that all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you, Abraham. Jesus, obviously, after his death, burial, and resurrection, gathered his disciples on a mountain in Galilee and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember I am with you always to the end of the age. It is the purpose of the people of God to extend the kingdom of God outwardly around this globe. Now for so, so long a theology crippled the church of Jesus Christ. A theology within its essence that robbed the supernatural out of the Bible and basically ended up with a get saved, give your heart to Jesus, punch your fire ticket so you don't go to hell, and then sit back on your pew and just study prophecy because Jesus is coming to get us out of this mess one time. Well, we know that isn't what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, yes, some of those things are true. He is coming again. Yes, there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. Yes, all of that. But he tells us something more than just sit back and do nothing. He tells us that we are to go out with the truth that we have, make disciples, and extend his kingdom. The, the very prayer we are to pray is a prayer that is a prayer full of imperatives. Kingdom come, will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. See God's kingdom come. See God's will be done on this earth. So how do we do this? How do we go through this and make this a reality in our lives? It's pretty amazing when you study the scriptures. We've not done a very good job of it at any given time. I mean, there's a few times when the church or the people of God did pretty well, and there's other times that they didn't do well at all. One of the times that we did pretty well was when you look at what happened with the early church. That early church uh, started out, had all power and authority given unto them, had a resurrected Jesus and presence among them. Of course, the widows started fighting over who's going to get fed first. And, you know, somebody lied to the Holy Ghost right off the bat about how much money they gave to the church. And they, and they were killed. And, and the churches were fighting and fussing. And Paul was writing letters to straighten this one out. It wasn't always perfect, but they were moving forward. But some of that moving forward came as a result of God forcing them to move forward by unleashing persecution in Jerusalem. But they began to go forward. And that mighty Roman Empire that so persecuted them through the years and kept persecuting them came to a point just 300 years. That's not a lot of time. 300 years. And the then uh, one in charge would proclaim Christianity as an official religion of the empire. People have looked and studied that and say, well, they did a pretty good job in 300 years of turning the world around and influencing the world. What, what exactly did they do? 
Now, one great scholar, a British scholar by the name of Michael Green, really gave his whole life to studying that very truth. What was it about the early church that made them so effective? Came up with three things. And here they are. Number one, they cared for those that no one else cared for. They reached out to the, to the widows and the orphans, children. Can you even imagine? We live in a day where children are worshipped. You know, can you imagine a culture that children were throwaways, they were nuisance, they were pushed to the side always, and especially if somehow or another they lost their family unit, they became orphans, no one cared for them. They begged, they had a horrible existence, and the church reached out to care for those type people and helped them, those that were crippled, those who had disease, uh, those that were uh, uh, left with uh, uh, no way to make it and, but begging. The church reached out to them. And by the way, the church has continued to reach out to those people through the years. It's just so amazing the ignorance of people who lead us today and don't understand the entire hospital structure and system we have in the West is a gift to you from Christianity. Thank you very much. We were the ones that come, came up with the idea to help those that were marginalized. Well, that made Christianity stand out. Secondly, they had ability to articulate an apologetic to answer their critics. In other words, these regular, ordinary people that didn't study in the schools and learn from the very important people had a way of standing up and under God's power articulating a very reasonable understanding of what they believed. It would blow everyone away. Where did these people come from? Early on in the book of Acts when they started doing it, the, the big-time preachers who graduated from the big-time seminaries said, these guys are a bunch of idiots, and they don't have any grammar. And look what they're saying. Where did they get this? So that made them stand out. The third thing that Michael Green noticed about the early church that he believes made the difference is that they experienced a power that was not of this world. They experienced a power. Just think about that. They cared for those no one cared about. They could articulate what they believed and why they believed it. And they regularly experienced a power that the world had never seen before. The resurrected Jesus power flowing in them that would change the world. A guy later that's a very modern apologist out on the West Coast by the name of J.P. Borland has written a book taking those three and he calls it the Kingdom Triangle. And he says we still need to take that idea and continue to use it to change the culture in this world. Well, if it's God's plan for his people to spread the kingdom that never ends from sea to sea and land to land, then maybe when we read our Bible, we just might see that in every teaching, every psalm, you know, every list of laws, all that's in there, there is in it truth about how we're to extend the kingdom of God, what we're supposed to be doing all along. I, I really believe this with all my heart. I believe people hunger for a perfect rule. People hunger for that. They really want it. That there, there's this ideology of, of all the time that this one's going to save us and this is going to save us. And they, they, People pour their lives into these things only to be disappointed time and time again because they fall, they fail in the end. We're watching it happening before our own eyes today. Can, can you even imagine that people would be so desiring of, uh, you know, help and, a, and an ideology that would help that people that were young and don't know better would say that socialism would be an answer to all of our problems, economic problems. I mean, when we look back and see how many people have died in, in, in kingdoms over that thing and that philosophy and and you see people, they're just so hungry to find something. You say, well, we just need... No, capitalism's got its problems too. You know, why? Because all the systems of man ultimately never work. Some are better than others, but they don't work. There's only one rule that works. It's called the kingdom of God. It's the only one that's going to last forever. It's the only one that will make a difference forever and ever. I want to I wanna look at um, Samson right quick. Pull out Samson and say, well, what's Samson got to do with all this? Well, I believe Samson is revealing to us a wisdom here that the world does not know that you and I are to employ in our lives. You might be surprised 
at what is in this passage as we look at it. First of all, I'm going to say that what we know they don't know is we know the wisdom of God's purpose. You and I have a knowledge that there is a God that made all of this, and he has a plan. He has a purpose. I preached a whole sermon on that verse, and it's the verse that in the midst of Samson doing everything wrong, and Israel, the children of Israel doing everything wrong, and his mom and dad seeming to do everything wrong, right in the middle of all that, it says in verse 4 of Judges 14, but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. Wow, just blow our minds once again, God. You mean you're in the middle of this? God said, I never left. You're picking a fight with the Philistines so your people will have to rise up and be distinct and different? Yes, I am. Here's what we know that we know. God has a purpose in everything. I don't always know what that purpose is, but God has a purpose in everything. His kingdom is ruled by his purposes, and he does them after the counsel of his own will, and he's never, ever, ever wrong. You and I love to know that there is a wisdom that flows that says God knows what he's doing. Don't always look like it from our human eyes, amen? I mean, let's just be honest. Sometimes it looks like God don't have a clue what he's doing. Asked our brother Job. Job said, it looks like God's cruel. What God's allowing to happen to me, it looks like he's cruel. It looks like God's reaching down like I'm some insignificant creature and he has taken his powerful divine finger and just knocking my legs right out from under him. He said, that's what it looks like, but, but I know that's not who he is. So then he said this, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's called faith. That's faith in the purposes of God, even when we don't understand the purposes of God. Now see, folks, the wisdom here of knowing this is wisdom by definition is possessing some knowledge that someone else doesn't know. We've got some wisdom. I go to someone. I call a friend. Have you got any wisdom on this? I just don't seem to understand what God's doing here. Do you got some wisdom on this? Wisdom, by definition, is possessing some knowledge that someone else doesn't know. Now, let me just real quickly say it. You and I have access to divine wisdom. We have access to divine wisdom. Now, can I ask you a question? When is the last time? You ask God to give you wisdom. When is the last time you did what the scripture says, if any man lack, let him ask of God, who gives wisdom to all men without partiality? Oh, you know, I would bet you anything. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I would bet a lot of your hands would go up because you'd get very desperate sometimes and you'd say, God, give me some wisdom on this. God, show us wisdom. God, show us what to do. But let me ask you this because it's going to get harder. How many and when was the last time you asked God to give you wisdom about a situation? And you expected to receive wisdom as you asked him for it. About half the hands would come down then. I asked him for it because I'm supposed to. But I didn't really expect him to do anything because he never really has before. I've really never seen it before. But why would God ask us or tell us or command us to ask him for wisdom when he had no intention of giving it to us? Sounds like a cruel God. Don't sound like the God we serve. How many of you have asked God for wisdom about a situation, fully expecting to receive it, now it gets even harder, and determined with boldness to speak up over what he reveals? Oh, we're down to nobody, or one or two of us now. Ah, oh, Lord, I'll ask for wisdom. Yeah, yeah, you told me to ask for wisdom, but... Lord, I'm asking because I believe fully you're going to give me that wisdom. You wouldn't tell me to ask if you're not going to give it. So, Lord, I'm asking, fully believing you're going to give it. And, God, I fully expect that once you give it, I'm going to have the boldness to speak up and say what that wisdom is in the situation. Wow. You, you, you would become the most important person. I don't, I don't care if you're, a, if you're a day laborer. I don't care if you're, you know, working in maintenance. I, I, you would become the most important person in your company tomorrow if you lived over that right there. Asking for it, 
fully expecting to get it and not afraid to speak up when it comes out. The wisdom of God's purpose. Number two, the wisdom of sudden victory. Verses 5 and 6 tells him to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. The lion came rushing without a warning. How many times does that happen in life? Everything's going well, everything's great, and wham! Out of nowhere, there's a fangs of a big old teeth and a roar coming behind it, ready to rip your head off of your shoulder. It, wham, comes out of nowhere. Very sudden attack of the enemy. Peter said, discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Because like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone he may devour. Here's one had been in his Bible. Here's one that's kind of moving down the wrong way in life. Easy target. Boom. That's why Peter said, discipline yourself. Be sober. Be alert. Be ready. He could come at any moment. The wisdom of a sudden victory. Here's what I mean by that. I mean that when the enemy comes like that, you say, man, i got to worry every day of my life. I've got to worry. Well, he might be behind that bush and he's about to jump out and get me right now. No, no. The, the joy is this. I've determined not to walk fearful of the devil. I've determined to walk in the anointing and friendship and power of the person of the Holy Spirit. So if the person of the Holy Spirit and his presence is on me, guess what? When any lion comes running, he's going to jump up and roar back. And he's got a greater roar than the roar of the enemy. That's exactly what happened in this passage. Here comes the enemy just uh, uh, roaring upon Samson in the very next verse. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he tore that line apart just like he had some Kentucky fried chicken and he was pulling the legs off for Sunday dinner. I mean, nothing to it. Just ripped it apart with his bare hands. He didn't even have a weapon in his hands. The Spirit's power in our life is what gives us that uniqueness of ability to walk in this world in wisdom. For yes, he attacks, but we have one stronger that lives within us. And he can guide us to victory. I'll tell you something else about this we learn. Anytime the enemy attacks, anytime he attacks, he, God has allowed him to attack so that you can whip him, send him on his way, and learn from it. And here's what you learn. If I won that battle, I can win the next one. If I, if I took him down there with the power of the Holy Spirit, I can take him down the next time. You don't believe that's true? Listen to what David said to Saul, the weak-kneed king, in the face of Goliath. And here comes little old David. David said, I'll go after him. And here's what he said. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it. And I struck it down. And I rescued the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go and may the Lord be with you. David said, Who's he think he is? If God got me through a bear, I, this guy's nothing. He's toast. See, it brings about a maturity in your life. Win a battle, step up. Win a battle, step up. Win a battle, step up. Know that God will be with you in any sudden attack that comes your way, and that will create a maturity in your life of this is nothing. I was in a church one time, young man, associate pastor, one of the men on staff, really messed up, really messed up. Come to find out, he was a pedophile. I didn't even know what that word meant. I was 26 years old. He was arrested. Well, how's the church going to survive this? Oh, my. He goes off and gets him some high some, you know, attorney from Minnesota, and he comes down, sues everybody. He's going to get a lot of money out of it, and he's going to get money out of what he'd done to some of these older teenagers. It is a big old mess. And you know what they sued the church for? $22 million. Now, let me tell you about that kind of lawsuit. 
when that kind of lawsuit comes about, if you lose that lawsuit, when it's over, you hand them the keys. Because you don't have $22 million. You give them the key. You've lost it all. Well, it was a stupid lawsuit. And, and some people saw right through it and got out of it and ended up being nothing before it was all over with. Fast forward about six or seven years later, I'm pastoring a church in another city. We hire a contractor to build a building. And he is building the building. And once a month, he will come in, meets with me, meets with all of his subcontractors. We go to the bank. He signs an affidavit that he's paid all of his subcontractors, gets a, uh, uh, you know, part of the loan, a draw on it, and we leave and go eat. And he goes back to his home in another state. Well, you know where this story's going. About six or eight months into it, we're probably about four months ready of completion. Word gets back to us, he's not paying the subs. So when I confront him, it gets to be a big, big mess. And he had his contracts with the subs, not with the owner. But you know how it always happens. They subs get together and sues the owner. Because we were dumb enough to hire this guy, I guess, you know. We started in doing depositions and all this. And guess what we got sued for? We got sued for $580,000. This was in a church that at that time probably had about a $3 million a year budget. Oh, the men were so worried. Oh, what are we going to do, Pastor? What are we going to do? Well, I said, if we lose, we write them a check. And we have church next Sunday. How can you say that? I said, I'll tell you how I can say that. Because I've been sued for $22 million. When you've been sued for $22 million, $500,000 is tiddlywinks. You know, if you have it. And, you know, so I mean, I was, uh, David is trying to say, look, I have fought these, these wars. I can go after him. And that's what this ought to teach you and me. When we look back over your history, what has God allowed you to do? What has he allowed you to overcome? What has he allowed you to fight with and win? How many times has the devil tried to steal something and it's been exposed and you've come through it? You may have some scars on you, but you've come through it. Write it down. Stand on it. Tell that testimony over and over again. Ah, and if he did that, he can do it here. That's that wisdom that we walk in of a sudden victory. I, I'm never going to get through. The wisdom of sweet honey. The promised land was a land described as a land flowing with milk and honey. I've sacrifices to God. Now sacrifices uh, in the spirit, but yet still bring a sweet, sweet smelling aroma to the nostrils of God when we sacrifice before him. Oh, it's a sweet journey we're on. We talked last week about how the picture here is, what the enemy tries to kill you with. You kill him, and then later you find sweet experience in it because you start killing lions, and he tried to kill you. You're, go you're defeating him with what he tried to feed you with. You know, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. He unleashed violence on you. You got through it. You came up. Now you're unleashing violence back on the enemy. The enemy can't win. He can't win. But here's what we know about this thing, this kingdom we're walking in. It's a sweet fellowship, is it not? I mean, I was telling you, I went through some attacks this week. But there was some sweet fellowship with the Lord along the way. There's some times it was just me and him. He knows everything. And we're just going through this together. And he's speaking to me, and it's just sweet, sweet fellowship. I worked in a bookstore not long after I got saved. This sweetheart of a lady worked there with me. Her name was Elizabeth Holloway. Her a son was a missionary with the Church of God to the, to the uh, island of the Philippines. And uh, she was such a saint. And she made a little, uh, little tape of her songs that she recorded. And I took them and played them on my little radio program that I had. Hey, everybody had to have a radio program. I had a radio program and I couldn't sing. So I had her on there singing. And she used to sing this song. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. She started singing this song. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, the more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven. My heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Every need he is supplying, plenteous grace he bestows. Every day my way gets brighter. The longer I serve him, the sweeter 
he grows. Oh, why would anybody not want to be a part of this kingdom and walk with a sweet Savior every day to know him and the sweetness of the fellowship of walking with him every day? Oh, what a Savior. The wisdom of solving problems jumps in here. Verse 10 is where it really gets to be all about it, and I don't have time to quickly just say it, but Samson poses a riddle to them. Why do you think he did that? I think I know why he did it. I think what would hap- was happening here is Samson was out of, out of position. He was in a Philistine camp with a bunch of Philistines. The only Hebrews probably were his mom and dad that were there. The Philistines had been dominating the Hebrews for 40 years. They made fun of them. They laughed at them. And they no doubt were sitting around saying, you're going to marry this dumb heathen, this old Hebrew. He don't know anything. He's stupid. He, he's not like us. He, does, he, he doesn't have a, pri- a proud background and he, great warriors and all that. No, he's just a stupid old Hebrew. Well, he'd heard about enough of that. So he said, well, let me put a little riddle out here to you and see if you can solve that. By the way, the word riddle in Hebrew is a, means a difficult problem, a hidden thing, a perplexing problem. So he puts that little riddle in front of them. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. They couldn't solve it. They could not figure it out. How could this dumb Hebrew put something out that we can't figure out? You know, he's just, he, you know, he, don't, he don't know any better. How's that any different today when people look at you and I as Christians that follow Jesus? You dumb Christians don't know anything. You, you're over there worshiping your, your gods, and you, you're just stupid. We know so much more about the world today. How ignorant and dumb are you? It's only the intelligent people of our day that can answer the problems. Well, look how good they've done so far with all the messes we're in everywhere. Oh, we're just a bunch of dumb. That's what they were doing. So, Sam said, well, I, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a riddle and see if you can, can, can you know, give a, a answer to it hmm. how many times are we taught in business principles we're, we're taught have you, you've taught oh, surely you've been taught this somewhere along the way never take a problem to your boss without a solution to go with it if you're the source of just a bunch of problems you don't have a job very long but if you're a source of a lot of solutions you're going to make yourself invaluable that's just a simple you know, thing that we learn in business that we go around. Um, what of the kingdom? What, do we have the Holy Spirit? Do, do, do we, listen, do we have a solution for every problem? Hmm. Man, last I checked, this book teaches the right way to do marriage. And when we do it the right way, it works every time. Last I checked, this book teaches us the right way to deal with money. Last time I checked, when we do it the right way, it works 100% of the time. This book tells us the right way we're to relate to one another. Last time I checked, when it's done the right way, it works 100% of the time. We, as Christians filled with the Holy Spirit, are plugged in to an inexhaustible resource of wisdom for every problem this world has. Are we strong enough to say, God, give it. I expect you will give it, and I'll be bold enough to say it. Even when it doesn't look right or when it's weird, I'll be bold enough to say it, to stand upon your truth. You see, folks, today, I want to ask you, where the Joseph's at today that can interpret Pharaoh's dream? You know, the dumb old Hebrew stuck over there in prison somewhere. I can do it. I can tell you what it means. And that dumb old Hebrew solved a problem and became second in command over the whole kingdom. Where are the Daniels at that will step forward in the cities of Babylon and say, I've got the answer. You want the answer? I'll tell you the answer. And speak forth the answers. Where's the Pauls at? Who are on a ship with a very experienced captain. 
and they're in a terrible storm. And Paul says, if you want to be saved, I can tell you how to get through this. Are you a sailor? What school did you go to? I'm a Christian. What? Well, it looks like you don't have any other opportunities. Listen to me, and I'll tell you how this boat and the men can be saved. So how could you do that? Well, it's real simple. God told me I'm going to Rome, so no boat is going to stop me. For storm is going to stop me from getting there. So I know what to do here. He gets on the little island, and uh, one of those snakes like I found down in the Amazon bit him, and they say when that snake bites you, everybody sends around and sings amazing grace. Because they're going to watch you die in about 15 minutes. And he grabbed that snake. When it bit him, he just threw it right back in the fire. And everybody went, oh, he's a god. I'm not a god. I just got a prophetic word in me. My god said I'm going to Rome. Ain't no storm going to stop me. Ain't no snake going to stop me. I'm going to Rome. Because God said I'm going to Rome. Where are the jo Josephs and the Daniels and the Pauls to do that? Listen, here's what this is all about. And I want you to hear this verse and I'm through. This is this verse. In the, in the book of the law, Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8. I don't have this up for you, so listen carefully to this verse. Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8. You must observe. He's telling about all the law he's given them. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who when they hear all these statues will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I'm setting before you today? When you act with wisdom, it is a compelling witness of the reality of the kingdom and the greatness of the king himself. That's what it says. Let me tell you something. When the church is silent, the world has a voice. When the church is silent, the world has a voice. That's why we got people out here doing the stupidest things you could ever imagine in this world. Throwing paint up against a wall and calling it art. Spending all of their money on things that will not matter. All because a church refuses to step up and tell the truth. And when we do tell the truth, they'll say, what a great God there is among that people. My goodness, when the church is silent, the world has a voice. There's a last thing here, I just got to say this, because he lost his discernment here, and he listened to his crying wife, and so he told her, and she ran and told them, bless her heart, she was in a bad position, she's going to have her house burned down, and her father's house burned down, so she's kind of stuck between uh, making a, didn't know what to do, but she did the wrong thing, told them, they told him, so he didn't have any clothes to give them. So the Bible says he went up to Ashkelon, killed 30 men. So that's horrible. Remember something about him. In Ashkelon, there were some Hebrew slaves there. There were 12 and 13-year-old girls that had been ripped from their family that were being used as sex slaves among the Philistines there. It's not like the Philistines were these great people. He goes up there, sees that, takes advantage of it to set those people free, and in doing so, he gets the change of clothes and brings it back, which gives me my final, final, final point. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. In wisdom and asking for it, God will give it to us. It's there. He'll bring it to us. He'll give us the discernment to speak it. He'll give us courage and boldness to do that. But listen, every once in a while, you just need old-fashioned power. You see, you can't have wisdom without power, and you can't have power without wisdom. Sometimes the Holy Ghost has got to come upon us just with power. Sometimes all the wisdom in the world won't get that cancer out of your body. But the power of the living Lord Jesus Christ standing here amidst his people and the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to that cancer will cause those cells to come to attention. And wisdom doesn't do it, power does it. You understand what I'm saying? You've got to have a king, a kingdom, a kingdom of wisdom, a wise kingdom, but you've got to have a king to go with the kingdom. And that's where the power comes from that you have to have in it as well. A king of the kingdom. Power unleashed. Let's pray together today.